Um, my name is Diane Mueller. I am the OpenShift Origin Community Manager at Red Hat, and I'm really happy to be here at OpenStack once again. I've been coming since the days of Essex, and I'm a big fan of OpenStack and all the wonderful things all of you people do. My colleague here, Chris Alfonso, who's so nicely down on his knees, going to play Vanna White, he's going to advance the slides for us, and then uh, once we're done with the slides part, we're going to make him stand up and do a really awesome um, demo uh, about taking OpenShift and deploying it on OpenStack with Heat. So how many of you here have heard of OpenShift before? My work is done, I can go. Great. Um, so we've been, I've been doing this talk uh, and versions of it um, for the past three OpenStack summits, so that means we're doing something right. Um, can you hit the next slide? So, um, because you've heard of OpenShift, and we are one of 100,000 open source projects that Red Hat backs, then um, you know a little bit about our ethos at Red Hat about taking open source and making it work in the enterprise. And as you can see, um, we've created basically a, a wonderful opportunity to use a pure open source cloud. Um, the guys from CentOS are here with us. I didn't get time to update the cluster piece to add Seth in, but the Seth folks are here. Um, over it, guys. We've got a lot of work going on in the JBoss community, um, and we're here with the RDO team, and we're really pleased to be included in this today's talk. But we're the people on the bottom of the little panda. Um, can you hit the next slide? This is the OpenShift Origin project. It upstream feeds OpenShift Online and OpenShift Enterprise. Enterprise is our on-premise offering. Um, it is a platform as a service. Hit the next slide there, then. Um, so it is the open source project. We eat our own dog food. We deploy um, OpenShift Enterprise. There's no switching between the code bases on online. It's been up and running for over 18 months now, live with over a million um, applications running on it. It is production ready. It is being used in enterprises. We have lots of customers. Uh, we have a few other cloud providers. GetUp Cloud is doing a wonderful job down in Brazil where I just came back from with this wonderful pool. Um, and they have hosted public pause for media um, enterprises uh, down in Brazil. So I don't need to explain to you what infrastructure as a service is or pause is or SaaS because you guys are the ones building it for us. So hit the next slide. But what I am going to say to you is that um, from a developer's perspective and from an end user's perspective, infrastructure really is not enough. What you're building here with OpenStack gives us all of the cloud compute resources that we want on demand and in an elastic and a wonderful way, um, and now in a wonderful open source way. But if you hit the next slide. Um, it gives you basically the network, the storage, um, all the compute on demand, but basically what it's giving me is a server in the sky, a server in the cloud, or a server in some server farm. Um, but as a developer or an ops person, you're still on the hook for configuring and managing and updating those servers um, for the environments that the applications are deployed on. So there we go. Um, well, what platform as a service gives you is everything that application needs, the application runtime environment, the entire LAMP stack, if you like LAMP stacks. Um, we can make that for you in bloody well every configuration you could possibly imagine. Um, and it basically gives you all of the tools to manage that infrastructure that is required for the application to run on the compute resources, um, running on top of OpenStack or bare metal or anybody else that I don't want to name. Um, it really makes the cloud very useful. So the way that we kind of think about it is you code your app if you're a developer, like me, you're doing Python on um, Python DJ, you can follow me on Twitter and see how bad of a programmer I am. Um, and I'll, you can take from GitHub, whether you're using clips or you're using the command line or you're using our web console, you can code your app push it from your GitHub repository, and um, take all of the, the pieces, whether it's um, your databases, your Apache, all of those wonderful things, and configure and deploy that application with its entire um, uh, configured LAMP stack, and then you're just off and running. And it's really a wonderful way. It's made me want to be a pro programmer again. 
Um, and it's really giving me now um, everything I need to become a more effective and agile um, developer. And it's something that's been being played with in the enterprise um, all over the world now. As I said, I just came back from Brazil. I've been over in Europe. It's pretty much one of the standard things that people are now deploying on top of their infrastructure as a service. So today what we wanted to do was try and talk a little bit about how there's many different ways to deploy on OpenStack. And we really have been um, focusing in our team on making sure that the heat orchestration tools worked really well with OpenShift. And we've been doing that for quite some time. We put in the OpenStack heat template directory all of the Fedora 19 scripts for deploying those heat templates. We have the OpenShift Enterprise ones, which we'll show you in a little bit. And we also have now, because CentOS has now been working with us, we have come out of the closet as CentOS lovers, um, as well on the OpenShift team, because it, we've actually been doing most of our test and build environment has been um, on CentOS for quite some time. So we just added in with the help of Jeff Peeler, who, I, who may be in the room or may not, um, from the Heat team, the CentOS 6.5 templates for doing that. So basically, if you think of the cloud, the platform as a service is everything that your app needs to deploy um, in the cloud. So I talked a little bit about some of the applications, but um, someone asked me a question a few, few minutes before we started about um, OpenShift, and we have this metaphor which we call cartridges. So that layer cake that is the cloud, our piece of it gets many flavors. And so I know I'm very Python-centric, but um, OpenShift comes out of the box with a whole lot of languages that it's already supported. So Python, um, Java, PHP, Node.js, Ruby, Perl. But there's also a way for you to extend that platform. It's a very highly extensible one by creating your own cartridges. And the cartridges are, then can be made available to everyone in your enterprise, or they can be specific to a project. Um, and that allows us to extend our platform and add new things like Go and other languages pretty easily. Um, and they, they're also different from other approaches in that these are made available across the entire OpenShift um, platform. So if you deploy Go, for instance, you can take that and push out Go, and not just for your own application, but for everybody's, and maintain and version that um, across the ecosystem that you've installed. So um, as I said, we, we host in lots of places. Um, OpenShift Online, I will admit at the moment, is running on AWS. Um, we'll, we'll work on that. Um, we run on OpenStack. We do run on CloudStack. We run on bare metal. We run on Rev. Um, and all you need is a um, Red Hat Linux, um, whether it's RHEL, Fedora, or CentOS, and we can create that for you. So what makes us different than other cloud platform as a service and things like that? Um, well, one, it is the RHEL and the Fedora um, capabilities and that, that's built in. We also maintain a really high level of security on the multi-tenant containers that we're creating. We're using SE Linux and C groups um, for our multi-tenancy and we are working very closely with the Docker folks and have, a, if you've been reading the PR press releases or seeing any of the demos that we did at Red Hat Summit, we're doing a lot of work with Project Atomic and Gear D to help bring um, true Docker support into OpenShift, and we can talk about that separate from here as well. The other thing that we do really differently is um, we do something called automatic application scaling. So if you take your application in the cloud and you deploy it, you say, okay, I have this much set resources. Um, a lot of other platform as a services will scale things for the pods. They'll add more resources for the platform as a service. But we actually go to the next level and scale your application up and down. And if your application isn't getting a lot of traffic, we have another concept called application idling, where we take your application and we will acknowledge the fact that you're not getting a lot of traffic and spin it down and not charge you for, or charge your department for that. Can we save the questions till the end? Thanks, because we got to squeeze some time. Um, so we do a lot of, that's, that makes us pretty different. The extensible architecture that we have based on cartridges and soon based on Docker. Um, the other thing is we have a um, real good support and a relationship with the Java folks and the JBoss folks, so anybody who's interested in that, we do a lot of work with them. And the other thing that's new and interesting is our support for .NET. Um, 
yes, we did bring .NET to OpenShift, um, and a lot of heads turned at Red Hat, hey, Linux house. And um, I, I love the fact that the, um, the gears and the, are called on the Windows nodes, Windows prisons. I think that's, that's probably the best name for anything, and the fact that I'm gonna have to put Visual Studio on my Mac is gonna scare everybody soon. Um, but one of the things that we've, what we've done um, over the past couple of months is partnered um, across the community with a company called Uhurusoft who made a huge donation um, to the community of all the code base to support .NET um, in OpenShift, and we're really happy to have them on board as part of our community now. Um, and that's another separate whole talk too, so I'm here all week. If you wanna hear that or see that demo, I'll give that to you separately from here. And one more slide, my friend. So if you wanna find out any more details about OpenShift itself, um, you can go to origin.openshift.com um, and uh, check out the, the blogs and the articles or send me a note um, there and we'll get there. We'll get one more. So what we're really here to talk about is the interesting thing for open stackers. How many of you have used heat? Awesome, I don't have to talk today, do I? You got, us, got it all down, Cole. So this is really about some really cool cross-community collaboration. And as a community manager, I'm really pleased with the, um, the way that all of these communities have come together, whether it's the Docker community or the Solemn community or the, the heat group um, or the OpenStack folks. They really have been amazing people to work with, and one of the projects that we're really happy to have been working with for quite some time now is, is the Heat Group. And um, as I mentioned, Jeff Peeler, Stephen Dake, uh, there's a whole crew of people I can't list that have been just marvelous to work with in terms of learning, teaching us about Heat, teaching us about um, creating templates. And so my man here, uh, Chris Alfonso, is going to take it over for a little bit and um, he's gonna talk about putting the paths in OpenStack. All right, All right, thanks, Diane. All right, just to give you guys an idea, um, I guess this is our, our third year of, uh, since, since the heat template has, or the, the heat project has, has been in existence. Um, it's grown substantially over time and has integration points in, with many of the OpenStack features. Uh, Heat has really been the basis for many integration points from the Red Hat perspective of being able to, to get our projects deployed on OpenStack. Um, over time, you'll see that um, that integration basis expand substantially. Um, we've got a project called Triple O to manage uh, deployments of OpenShift using, or OpenStack using OpenStack. Um, you have integration points around security, around storage, around monitoring, around uh, image management and, and uh, command line tools and uh, web UI uh, integration points and, and those all have uh, touch points with heat. I'm gonna show you an example of, of uh, really what I spend a lot of my, my time on is, is OpenShift Enterprise uh, being deployed on, on OpenStack. And just to give you um, some background on, on where heat came from and, and why it exists. It, its real mission is all about infrastructure orchestration. There's been a lot of conversations around, well, is it a configuration management tool? Where's the, where's the uh, dotted line stop between different components of your infrastructure and what's actually running in your infrastructure? And heat has really held true over time to, to just uh, being in the business of managing orchestration and, and uh, leaving that as a core competency and leaving integration points uh, around what you actually run in instances running in your infrastructure to configuration management uh, packages. And it, really the, the user data section of instances is really where, where that handoff happens. And I'll show you some concrete examples of how OpenShift actually utilizes that, that integration point. Uh, I won't spend too much time on, on this one because uh, we're sort of doing a lightning talk uh, on, on this one. We, I think we have about another half an hour. Um, if you're interested in looking after this presentation at some of the heat template examples that we've prepared that you can try on your own, you can go to github.com, look in the OpenStack repository or um, namespace and you'll see heat templates. There's things like a highly available direct directory that has a readme that tell you how to deploy 
a multi-node open stack or multi-compute node open stack infrastructure with uh, multiple uh, brokers and multiple OpenShift nodes uh, running all, all together for one OpenShift fabric. So go ahead and look through there and, and start at the, the, the basics that we'll go through today. And uh, um, you can, you can uh, look as deep into that as, as you like. Um, this diagram is up here not really to, to teach you about OpenShift, but to give you an idea of the, the infrastructure that's required to successfully deploy an OpenShift enterprise or OpenShift origin infrastructure. Um, for all the services to uh, coordinate together and, and be running and, and uh, be secured, there's a lot of infrastru infrastructure um, configuration that has to happen. You have things like mounted storage, you have security groups, you have uh, instances that are able to uh, use floating IP addresses, they all need to talk to each other. So what I'm gonna demonstrate to you is how you would set up a, a two virtual machine uh, infrastructure that uh, one is an OpenShift broker, one is an OpenShift node, and it actually becomes a multi-tenant aware uh, node application hosting service. So uh, I'll show you how you do that. And I've taken a video of this in time-lapse package installation so that uh, we don't have to sit here and watch paint dry because it actually does take longer than the Summit lunch lines. So let's see. So there, there are three steps to the, um, uh, I just bleached my retinas, that's great. So there, there, there are a couple different steps to getting your infrastructure up and running uh, in OpenStack. So the first thing you have to do is have images registered with OpenStack Glance. And the, you, you can either just download an, a prepared image or you can um, create your own images and save them as snapshots, customize them. Um, what I like to do is the the end state of deploying an OpenShift infrastructure, I, my intent is to be able to bring up an OpenShift node as fast as possible so that um, when I'm in a, in a production environment, if I start to run out of capacity in my own OpenShift installation, I wanna be able to bring up additional compute capacity very quickly. And so normally when you set up or install um, uh, create a virtual machine, install an operating system, install packages, configure any configuration files, get everything up and running. It, that, that's a, a lot of latency. You have to wait for packages to download. You, or whether, Even if you have local repository, you have to go through a, um, an installation process, a configuration management process. Um, so what I like to do is prepare a virtual machine image beforehand, get it all ready, and just maintain that in a library such that when it's time to instantiate it, it comes on line as fast as possible. So one of the OpenStack tools that uh, makes this possible is called Disk Image Builder. And Disk Image Builder is uh, essentially a, a, it's a binary that will, will run through a templatized version of, uh, it looks at every stage of what you need to install. So from, from startup to package management, configuration management, what you want to have happen one time or every time the machine comes a machine comes up, it, it's very extensible. And um, what I've done here, and I'll go ahead and just play this. Uh, um, I created a rel uh, disk image builder element. And what that looks like is, I'll go ahead and get a, get a tree view of this going here. So that you can, this is also um, on GitHub, you can look at uh, many of the disk image builder uh, elements. Let's make sure this is actually there we go. Okay. So I'm running this on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6.5. Um, and I'll go ahead and show you the disk image builder tree. Oh, I loaded the wrong file. Let me make sure. Okay. So I, I just skipped past the showing you the tree. And I'm going to show you ex actually exercising the disk image builder um, um, command. Uh, command line utility, and this is going to build a broker image. I've blurred out a couple of things just so, like passwords and 
and such. But you can configure things like the disk image size and uh, what, what elements you would like to load onto disk image builder's path. And you can tell it what type of image you're going to build. I've said to that I'm going to make a, a virtual machine, and it's going to be a uh, rel operating system installing all the OpenShift Enterprise um, uh, broker uh, packages. So I'll go ahead and uh, the lag on this is completely terrible. Let's see if I can catch up here. Okay, well, the, not only did, did I time lapse that, I quit it just now so I can skip to the next one. Um, all right, so the end result of running a disk image builder run is, is a, an image that you are able to register with the Glance service. And so at the end of that clip, you would have seen a Glance registration, and then it would look like this. So um, if I run a Glance index, I can see that I have a broker and a node image registered. And the reason why I need to register those is that every heat template for a virtual machine instance, you need to reference the Glance image name or the image that's registered with Glance by name so that um, heat knows which virtual machine to, to instantiate. And before I show you this video, I'm going to just jump over to a text file and I'll blow up the text here just to give you an idea of what, what we're talking about when, when we say, um, or when I mention a heat template. So a heat template is just an ASCII file in YAML format that has a bunch of declarations, things like, uh, well, really a descriptor of what your complete infrastructure is going to look like, or at any snapshot in time, what your infrastructure is going to look like. You can pass in parameters at runtime. When you, when you instantiate heat to say, set up all my infrastructure, you can say, well, well specify things like, well, what, what is the domain name? that I want to deploy this infrastructure under, what's the name server I want to use, what, uh, what size machines should these, uh, or what f open, uh, instance flavors should these be using, what, what type of resources should be allocated to the VM, et cetera. Uh, you specify things like um, auto-scaling parameters. Uh, you specify things like, uh, well, this one is OpenShift enterprise specific, so, so you'll see things like, um, what's the RHN registration credentials and subscription uh, information, et cetera. Uh, but in infrastructure-wise, so, so there are things like uh, neutron network uh, subnets and networks and ports and things like that you'd need to declare in your infrastructure. Um, you would want to specify things like, well, what security group should these instances be uh, set up in? So what 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 should the firewall rules look like for ingress and egress? Uh, you would want to specify things like, okay, you see the neutron port that gets created here, the, the floating IP that gets allocated to, to the broker, and so on and so forth for the node. Um, but what, where the real meat is uh, when you deploy an infrastructure like this is, well, what happens when the VM comes online? And we talked about, well, how is, how is heat really uh, helping us set up an open shift infrastructure? Well, all, all the components that we talked about already, those are really for any infrastructure. And what makes this an open shift enterprise uh, deployment is, is uh, what happens when a VM comes online. And the user data section of a broker instance or a, a, a OS Nova server instance is uh, everything that gets initialized by CloudInit. So CloudInit's going to look at whatever's passed in this user data. Um, there's a lot of uh, environment variables that go on here. They get passed to an OpenShift installer. The OpenShift installer interprets all that, installs or configures a bunch of packages. It will, will update the machine with any errata that's happened that has been published between uh, the time the images were created, um, make sure the SE Linux is on, uh, things like that. And, and really that's um, all that happens. And when, when that full process is done, the last thing that happens in this user data is there's a CFN signal that's fired that sends a signal to the, the heat um, metadata server and says, hey, the, uh, the server instance is running. Go ahead and um, notify heat that this machine is, is done being configured. And so I'll just show you a quick video on, on how that happens or what happens when we, when we run this, and hopefully there'll be no lag here. 
So this is a command line utility uh, for heat. You can also do this through the Horizon web UI, but this one will just fire off the create command. I'm gonna call, give it a stack name, and I have no idea if you can, you probably can't see any of that text, so. Uh, I actually don't think this refresh is working at all. Huh. Well, we may uh, be cutting this a little bit short if there's no, yeah, there's no uh, I'm having, unfortunately, this video is not even uh, refreshing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I could pull that up too. I, I know that this has a little bit of different editing, so, um, but yeah, let me go grab that real quick. Um, if you guys don't mind bearing with me real quick. Oops. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Let's go to the um, blog. And I believe it's uh, down here somewhere. Let's see. So you're getting a good tour of um, where all of the content is for OpenShift. Uh, and he's got. Let's see what the resolution ends up being like on this. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Okay, so here's the disk image builder part port part here. Uh, we'll just jump past all the package installation. Okay, so here's the here's the uh, actual <laughs> heat creation. Let's see how well this refreshes here. Mm -hmm. that would be considered a local laptop for monitor issue. Alrighty. That is awesome. Well, give it a couple minutes and then I will ad hoc a demonstration. Yeah, I'm working on that. And here I thought I was gonna save you a bunch of time by time-lapsing a video. Yeah. Okay, so. Maybe it's actually going to work at least. Okay, so I, I showed a create there, and that is really small and blurry. Um, so let me just kind of talk about what's happening here in this video. Is um, Now I'm looking at the Horizon dashboard just to see that the instances were created. You can use the heat command line tool to look at the status of a stack build. So you can use heat event list or, um, or um, to look at the specific events that are actually being being fired off. And when you look at that list of events, uh, it may be really confusing when you first look at it because um, each record that's recorded is not updated. It's, it's actually a, a sequence of events. So you'll see create in progress, create in progress, but if you'll actually see um, event names or resource IDs duplicated down as you go look down the list and you'll see things like create complete and that way you know that that resource has actually been completed. And you'll see things like a, a, wait, um, a wait condition. And it, when we look at that, that CFN signal part of user data in a VM instance, whenever that gets fired, that's when you know that the um, uh, wait condition has been satisfied. And then you can look in the heat event list. You can see that the event has actually uh, been completed. So, uh, I've fin here in the video, I've, set, I've finished set up the OpenShift infrastructure and logged into the broker and run RHC setup, which is the OpenShift um, 
command line tool. I'm doing an RHC setup, setting up my domain name, making sure I, I set up an authentication credential, an authorization token, set up a, a, a domain name space. Uh, for this one, I'm using Funzo. And, and the output of that is basically a, a set, a, a, a number, a list of application runtime languages, or web frameworks is what we call them, um, that you can create an application with. And for this uh, demonstration, I think I'm, I'm going to uh, create a, uh, either a PHP 5.3, um, yeah, PHP 5.3 application. As soon as that, is, that create app run is done, DNS will be configured and propagated worldwide, and you'll be able, I'll be able to pull up that application in a web browser. And we'll do that in just a second as soon as um, DNS is done propagating. Okay, the output of that is, is a lot of information around your application, an SSH URL, you can log in to your, to your gear, you can look at uh, what's running in your gear, running in that node VM. I've set up the, uh, my network preferences here, w pointing to my broker because I'm running bind on my broker server VM, and because I do that, I can go to this PHP application and just, and just pull it up. Um, Another thing I can, I can demonstrate with this is a simple update. So if I go into um, that test PHP directory, I can update um, the source here and do a simple uh, update to the, the index page, save it, commit it, and push it. Uh, do a git push and the application will just be redeployed and it's up and running. So it gives you a way to set up infrastructure on OpenSAC set up OpenShift on there and be able to, as a developer, be able to have an application created, all, all the configuration around it, around having a proxy, around having um, all the, the uh, uh, ability to scale up the application, scale it down, have it idled, have it be um, one of, of many uh, tenants on a, on a node, have it be secured, uh, have all the firewall security set up, uh, your, and your, and your uh, code sharing, uh, your Git repository, um, all set up so that you can add members to it. You can have set up teams of developers um, and you don't have to do any other configuration other than just what I showed you to do so. And then you can use the, the uh, uh, developer console to create other applications. We have uh, run times. And if you do this online, you can see a lot of quick starts that we don't ship with OpenShift Enterprise because we don't ship them because we don't support them. We just enable them. But if you go to OpenShift uh, online or grab Origin, there's a lot of uh, quick starts that uh, you can just pick blogs and different types of uh, bleeding edge frameworks to, to create applications with. But um, here you can see the same process. It's like boiling water here. So it's, uh, well, if I use the right scheme. Um, and so there's my Ruby application. So in a nutshell, that is what Heat has been able to, uh, has enabled us to do, is deploy an entire infrastructure. So the demo was, it was canned. It was, we, we will admit it, you can tell it. Um, if you throw up the slides there. If, could you go to the, um, the Git repository for the templates too, just so people see where that is again? Sure, yeah. Um, we, I think we have about five minutes left in our time, but our time. this is, uh, github.com slash openstack slash heat templates. So everything that he showed you there, the templates, I saw people taking pictures, I'll post the slides up in SlideShare slash OpenShift and you can have them all and I'll tweet it out. But everything that he showed you there for the enterprise, for um, Origin on Fedora, Origin on CentOS is all in the heat templates in the OpenStack repo. Okay, so what we're looking for um, is for you guys to go out and play with it and test it and give us feedback, make pull requests against it if you find something that you don't like, fork it, create um, different versions of it, and give us feedback on it. That's really, it's been, we've been using it for I don't know, six or seven months um, for enterprise deployments and for um, a lot of Fedora folks have been playing with as well. The CentOS stuff is relatively new, so we would really like to get you, um, if you're a CentOS fan, um, to give us give that a try as well and give us your feedback on it. Let me go back to my slide. I'm not sure what I left for slides for you. Yeah, some some of the best some practices. best practices. But we've got about five minutes for questions. Yeah. So why don't we stop and let's see if we can get some questions. You want to stand up? No, 
That's correct. And, and, and really the, the idea behind that is in order to have RHEL, you have to have uh, subscription. And, and so we just targeted, um, div, kind of uh, allocated our time to what we thought uh, people would want to use. But yeah. uh, the, the stuff that's on CentOS should be directly applicable to yeah. RHEL. Yes. It looks pretty similar, except for the user data. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, the origin stuff. Um, so you, you saw that I was using an OpenShift.sh. Uh, it's a bash script for our OpenShift Enterprise installer. The differentiation between what you'll see with origin is um, Papa based uh, installation yes. configuration. And with, with Enterprise, um, we, we do a few other things. And it actually predates our, our Puppet work. So, um, but I. Uh, in the next little bit, you'll see some other interesting things with a tool that um, is called OO install, and, and that will be shipping with um, OpenShift Enterprise 2.1. Um, that will have compatibility with OpenShift.sh as well as um, uh, Vagrant based installation. Yep, that's a known bug, and, and the Heat team has been working on that. I don't know if they, if they made it for... What's that? It's Ice House. Uh, what was your workaround for those that are... To the Wakeners. Okay. Right. Uh, can you, you, you can use nested templates, but that specific issue with Ice House is, has been addressed. Yeah. yeah. And deep for debugging here, have a USB key from us, and thank you for that. <laughs> Send us the Any notes. other quick questions that we can fit in in the back? The, the applications are actually being run in the in the VM itself. So what I demonstrated was a was a two virtual machine uh, infrastructure setup. One is an OpenShift broker, and one is an OpenShift node. All the applications that are created are created inside that application node virtual machine. Correct. We are using PAM namespaces. We're using uh, C groups for resource allocation and uh, SE Linux labeling. Yep. Yes. That, that's not addressed with this. Um, so there, there's a couple different um, scaling ideas here. One is that that you're referring to is OpenShift based. Scaling, and then the right, and and so that's that most of that implementation is a is in our HA proxy um, uh, control daemon. That uh, so there's that aspect. So there's there's some uh, a long list of issues to address there. There's also um, making applications highly available. Meaning, well, what happens when um, Brokers are introduced or taken away, or no, actual nodes are introduced or taken away, um, and then there's also then there's the infrastructure auto scaling that uh, Heat has the ability to do as well. But um, right, and I'm working on the other stuff within the application. If I set my OpenShift application to auto scale, does that still have limitations to scale it? And there's still there's a little point of failure within the proxy. You can have. Redundant. You can have multiple HA proxies now. Yeah. Um, that, that that, so that's a that's a fairly new feature. You have to set set your um, uh, the PaaS admin has to set up uh, the user to allow HA proxy or HA applications, um, and then when you create a scaled application, uh, your second scaling it'll introduce a second HA proxy. Um, so that's a, that's a new feature. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, the scale the scaling al algorithm tries to place those those gears on different on on different virtual machines or different bare metal machines. Um, I mean, I can take it one level further though, because it could essentially scale it on two instances, right? No instances mm -hmm. that reside on the same network compute system, right? So yeah. Would, yeah. 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 We could spread that out. Okay. But there, yeah, I, I, I've I've tested um, that a bit, and I've seen some some wonkiness there of, of some unexpected results around the, the scaling algorithm. So it, it's definitely definitely a possibility to to end up on the same compute right, host. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you all for knowing about OpenShift in advance. And um, well, thanks for your patience and, with my uh, demo yeah. video lag. Thank you very much.